Can you stand up? And stretch. And uh, give your hand to your neighbor and uh, give some energy because you need some energy. So, good. Good, we can sort this out while the presentation is going on, but it's good to have energy. And this is something that you need to learn in the work environment. It's not about being yourself. You need to connect. You need to give hands. You need to look at the eyes. You need to, to be fresh every day. Because people is not interested in your scientific argumentation all the time. They, they, they want personal relationships. They, they want connection. And after the connection is made, then, then you go on. OK, while we have the presentation uh, loading, I just want to tell you that uh, I'm here to speak to you for about 20 minutes. And this is about, uh, I thank you very much, Alborg University. I'm a kind of a child of Alborg. I, I took my, my PhD here. And it's much more than an honor to come back and, uh, and share what has happened to me in the last eight years or so. But uh, all in all, uh, what I have to say is that um, this uh, has been a very personal journey for me. Having to sit back after 15 years that you have been through the, 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 the PhD studies and then into the work market and have to think about what you have done and why you have done that. It's kind of a very uh, personal experience. So some of the stuff that I'm going to show here, it's, it's only my story. And then you can decide if you can take some of it for you or it's just crap and throw it out and uh, forget about it. So just for you to know that what you will see, uh, hear me saying, it's, it's much different sometimes than what they just said in a keynote speak or what the previous presenter said. But you will see also some connections. Uh, my story, I, I will start in 2001 uh, when I came to Alborg. Uh, I, I come from Brazil, from Sao Paulo, 15 million people. A lot of energy, a lot of people everywhere. Uh, violence and poverty, uh, in all the streets and everything, and then I come to Alborg. <laughs> With uh, 64 kilos of baggage uh, and no idea of what I was going to do in the PhD because I came as a guest researcher to find out what I should do. And, uh, and that's uh, where it goes. So 2001, it starts the whole thing. Are we there? Yes, we are there. So 2001 it starts the emotional journey of creating anything that's great. All the possibilities were there. Of course, the, the PhD would be three years and everything would be perfect and I would be a laureate afterwards. And then you get in the dark swamp of despair that you have to try to cross the bridge without getting stuck there. So I know, I think you know the truth. Uh, there is a lot of enjoyment in the PhD, but there is a lot of suffering as well. So, and, and this suffering, it makes you to be very humble at the beginning and say, please, Give me the title and let me home, or something like this. <clears throat> and then I was fortunate enough to get a, a tenure track position. I got an assistant professorship position uh, right in the end of my PhD. And uh, then, of course, as a grad student, I, I'm going to save the world. My research is the best. Uh, and uh, there is a lot of social investment that you put on it and so on. And then uh, uh, three years after being an assistant, I realized that I was more trying to produce uh, statistics in papers than really doing something that has had meaning for me. And uh, this was a, a very uh, shaky moment where I said, OK, forget it. I, I just want to try something else. Maybe I'm just tired. So let's see what is out there. The funny thing is, in the middle of this way, um, I, was, um, I was because I couldn't get lecture time enough uh, in classes. I could not supervise enough the amount that I should do. I got as a subject matter expert to the library of Auburn University. So I was selecting books and journals and database and seeing what the students would look like would like to see and what resources were needed from the library. And that was, not, that was something like 10% of my job and just a side job. But interestingly enough, Novo, Nord, uh, Novo Nordisk uh, had a, a, a library 
and they need a specialist that could do subject matter selection to the, to the library of, all board, of uh, Novo Nordisk. And it was a library of 30 people. And uh, the average uh, timing job there was 20 years or something like this. And I was the only PhD starting and the only one that didn't speak Danish. But they need somebody that could shake the bag, could move the, the thing on, could uh, transform finding information into processing information, into getting data into meaning. And that's what P PhDs are all about. It's getting data and making meaning out of it. And, uh, and uh, I help, uh, I help the medical affairs, medical and science develop, and do this kind of overviews, for example. What are the facts and figures of hemophilia, of diabetes? What is out there in the edge of the research of diabetes? And the thing that I've noticed that they said, oh, thank God. Now we can talk the same language. You can take an article and you can process. You can look from the abstract and already, ha and already have a feel of what is this study about. Is it a good study? Is it a good design? Or the, is it just a, a, a conference article? So I could have this very intense conversation with researchers that were really doing the job. But you have to, to remember that a research in a big company at least is not a 10 people group. It's a 500 people group. And you have to take yourself the humility of saying, I'm going to take care of only this tiny bit that is finding the information in the literature and do my best to get this information so that the group can benefit from it. It's more of taking this approach of, I'm not the responsible for everything. I'm only responsible for the very, very small thing that in the end, it will make the difference to the team. And uh, <clears throat> after eight years at the uh, at um, no, after six years at the at the, uh, the, the Novo Nordisk Library, we actually managed, or I'm proud to say that I was one of the drivers to bring the Novo Nordisk Library to something that now is called global information and analysis. So, no library anymore. Now you are not the ones that are responsible in collecting data, but you are the ones that are synthesizing information and knowledge so that you can make decisions out of it. And this is what you can do as a PhD. You can come to a library, it's hopeless, you don't have anything to do, but your drive can make this happen. But then of course, I always get homesick. There is no shame in feeling homesick. It means that you come from a happy place. Um, and I always miss at uh, Alborg University very much. And I was always thinking, oh, I just want to get home to my old lab and my colleagues and uh, not wearing fancy clothes and uh, not being nice with people every day and being able to be myself. But one way that uh, I got uh, toward it, and now it's some reflections, because now it's six years, five years, five, six years that I, I'm doing this kind. And it's a very uphill. You put a lot of energy, and you're trying, you are trying to find yourself. As they just said before, you don't have idea of complexity. So you are trying to get this complexity into you. So how you get back to your roots? Well, I started. I always kept connection with my fellow mates at the university. I, I got into a censor uh, work, so I could always read the work that was going on here. I could uh, be referee in different journals. So I was this, uh, this hidden referees that reject your papers all the time. I was one <laughs> of those. So it, it, there are ways that you leave the universe, but you can always keep the, the one foot back so that you have this feel that you, you can do some difference. And, uh, and then it went like that. I, I did some uh, censorships. But let's, let's reflect a little bit what, what is a PhD then? What, why, you have questions uh, several times, why do they want to hire you and not a master? Basically because the PhDs are quite a, of a good deal. A master with seven years experience corresponds to a PhD in the, in the work market today, roughly. So if you take a master and put seven years of experience 
it will be equivalent to you that has three years of study. And why is that? Because you have suffered the hell <laughs> to get through and, and you have been trained to, to, to be good at what you do. So in reality, it's a, very, it's, it's a very good jump that you do. But there are some problems. Uh, I love Dilbert. So this guy was saying, I have no real world experience and I'm incompetent at everything. But unlike any of you, I have a PhD and that means that you have to take me seriously. <laughs> and that was me. Exactly like that when I came to, into the work environment. And, uh, and the guy said, it's pretending allowed totally. It all looks the same to me. So the message is, you are going to look like an ET, especially if you, are, if you are landing into a group of non-PhDs. You are the special one, the one that uh, people don't understand, or you are very uh, arrogant, and this kind of thing. And this is natural. And uh, you are. I think by hearing this now, I've never had this opportunity. You are already one step ahead. You are aware of that. I, I wasn't. I was just the, the joker in the, in the department. And then there are some interesting stuff that happens that you think because you have a PhD, you are from a superior human class, and that, that you are entitled, for example, for a senior position after only one year at the job. I, I have a PhD, so I sh should be not a... Uh, a scientific uh, specialist, but a senior scientific specialist. But the reality is not exactly that. Uh, you need to develop these extra skills uh, that Vibeke was talking about, these side dishes, because it's not only about what you know as a scientist, it's something else. And then there is another thing. They will not give you a censorship and they will not give you a team to lead either unless you have the natural skill of being a leader. But you have to remember one thing. You need to, lead, to learn how to manage your boss. You need to be the leader of yourself and of your boss because PhDs basically they are paying the ass. They want too much all the time. They want challenge all the time. They are never settled. And my, my, I had really nice managers, uh, three or four of them, and, and they said all the time, you are paying. You get a, a task, you solve, and then you want more, and then, and then we, it never stops. And then at some point, I got uh, kind of uh, bored, and I said, okay, forget it. I will try to do something else. So instead of leaving the job and come back to the university, I said, okay, I'm feeling, because I've applied for seniorship positions, I've, I've applied for team leader positions and this kind of things, but I was not mature enough. And they would say to me, you have a great set of skills, you are not experienced. So I've convinced my, one of my, my managers to, to pay me a, a business degree then. I said, okay, give me a part, a development activity that I can learn that, that I can I can do that. So I've started the mas uh, master that's called Leadership Innovation Complex System, and I can tell you, this was one of the best decisions that I've made. I've complemented my profile as a PhD with some, some more humanistic. And on top of that, I understand what innovation is really about. We talk about innovation all the time, and I had this idea of innovation, innovation, innovation. But innovation is when you take a great idea to make money, to turn into profit. Innovation is not just a great idea in the paper that will generate a couple of, uh, of uh, publications. You need to have this leap. The idea has to turn into profit. And this is something that I didn't realize before I did this course. So uh, this uh, master, two years where I learned the uh, stakeholder relationship, project management, this kind of stuff. I'm not saying that I'm perfect on that now, but if you are aware that you are going to use these skills at some point in life, maybe it would be a good idea for you to be aware and start looking at the things right now if your plan is not staying at the university. Or even if you stay at the university, because the university, they are turning into professional, env professional environments. They are professional environments, but they are turning into enterprise-like uh, uh, places. And there was, is where you learn that, um, that the innovation things, the innovation phases where you have gates 
that you, it's not only come and say, I have a very great idea. Okay, you have a very great idea. How much of the population can buy your idea? How much it costs to produce? Uh, how long it will be in the market? What are the risks to the users? What are the benefits? What is the legal environment? Do you have to regulate that? For example, I work in medical device environment. Regulation is everything. If you cannot get approval from the authorities, you cannot sell. You cannot get reimbursement. So it's a whole world that opens in, before your eyes where when we think innovation at the university, and I did it myself, innovation is about, to, it's about creating something great. But then you have to take the reality. That is turning into profit. And there is where I learned something about that. But then doing this, uh, this master, I realized that I like very much rights, and, and uh, I got a trauma during the university, during the PhD. I was totally burned out, so I didn't want to write anymore. And then it took like six to seven years for me to realize that I really like to, walk, to write. And then, and then I, by the end of the, 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 the master, I said to, to my manager, thank you very much, you paid me two years of a development course, and now I'm saying goodbye because this is not my place anymore. I need something else. And then I turn into a medical writer. And this is the medical writing cycle of uh, pharmaceutical industry. Still in Novo Nordisk, I changed departments. And, um, <clears throat> and each cell here, it's a kind of document that you have to generate in order to approve a, a drug. And this takes eight years. And uh, sometimes you take something like this, a pediatric investigational plan, and you are working with that for eight years. Or you are working with the, the end here where you have to report on the safety of your product. product. And this is where I, I was working for one and a half year. But then I realized that it was a too different of an animal to write a medical writing in a pharma company to a medical writing scientifically. Uh, there, in the science, you are much Freer, and you have five reviewers, and then you have here you write a document of 80 pages, and it's revised by 40 people, and you have something like 500 comments to a document of of uh, 80 pages, and you have to use all these skills of project management and the stakeholder management and connection in order to get your document through. You see? Where, where it miss, it, it just not enough to get the, the technical. You need to get the, the human is behind it. And, uh, <clears throat> and then for sure, again, I got bored. Uh, writing and uh, trying to solve comments and everything, and my life was like, okay, it's gonna be my life writing 80 pages and solving 400 comments every single time that I produce a document. Then, uh, then after one and a half year of uh, doing medical writing, which I enjoyed very much in the end, I discovered that I was not stupid writing after all. You get much more, uh, and this is the funny thing of work in the industry, is that when you do it right, you get much more reward, and you get much more recognition and feedback. Great, you did, you did really good. In the universe, okay, you publish a paper, move move on, publish another paper, and you, you don't get this thrill. And, but here you get, but I got bored anyway. And I got bored and I applied to Coloplast. And it's, it looks like, the, it sounds like the Heroes Press, but uh, I'm really happy with my job right now. These are the, I've just put you the mission and values of Coloplast. Uh, they, well, Coloplast basically, they, 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 they work with uh, intimate care. That's catheters to the ureter of patients that cannot pee. That is bags of, uh, to collect the feces of people that had the uh, ostomy. That is uh, wound care, that's uh, all the intimate parts that people don't want to talk about. It's difficult to test. And it's people that are suffering and, uh, and struggling with their life because they have incontinence. They cannot pee or they pee too much or, or they cannot poo or they poo too much or too little, and you have to find ways of easing the life of these people in a very scientific way, because you also have to, to show that there is a benefit. There's not only risks that you put the patient on. 
And I put this, this to you because I think I'm kind of there and I will not be there in, in two years, I'm, I'm sure. Because I will get bored again and that, that's life and you will get bored. Uh, but right now, I, I think if you can do something that you like and you find a purpose on it and you can get the money for this, then you are, you are in your sweet spot. And, and maybe that's your mission, it's find your sweet spot. What you can do and like to do and you get money for it. And uh, just to show why I think this is my sweet spot right now, it's that... Uh, I have to maintain clinical documentation. I have to go to a project, they have a bright idea, and I have to uh, help market and uh, market access and reimbursement and the regulator and everything, and the patients most importantly, and say, do my project, uh, do this proposal brings benefit to the user? Yes. Is there a risk? Yes, so what is the benefit and what is the risk? That is a clinical evaluation. And you have to find scientific background to the project all the time and decide if you have to test, if you have to do preclinical tests, if you have to, all sorts of ways. Do you need to, to do uh, uh, bench models, preclinical models and everything? And then you have to talk to authorities. Then you have to find out what is, uh, Germany wants to know in scientific terms from your product so that the authorities will pay for it so that the users can benefit from your product. So it's, it's, it's a lot of stuff. I, have, I don't have a, a single day that I plan that I do the, in the end of the day, do everything that I've planned in the start of the day. Because it's very dynamic, it's very, there are, there are things coming from all the places. And uh, just to show you, so uh, here I could, I could uh, combine the PhD with my library thing, with the, 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 the transforming information into knowledge, into managing not people, but managing yourself and managing all the people that is around you. Because managing is not just about telling people what they have to do. It's about to bring them together with you so that you can do uh, one thing all together. The innovation part and a lot of, lots of writing. I'm still writing. But it's in a very uh, different environment. And uh, the world is becoming more and more regulated. And we all know that. And uh, as for uh, from one month for now, there will be a new medical device regulation coming out from the European uh, Union. And, uh, and that it's, it's a golden opportunity for PhDs, for masters, for everyone, because now you need much more than ever to show the benefit of your drug and the, the benefit of your, your, of your product. And not only drug, not only medical device. There are electrical cars coming do, uh, down there that they will have a lot of different safety discussions. There are a lot of regulations. So, and what do they need for this regulation to happen and for your products to comply is that they need thinkers. They need people like you that can take a matter and can make a rational and present and be convincing and sell your product in a responsible way. And uh, the, the road is uh, it's, it's, it's long. I, I have been eight years out of the university. I still, I still have plans to come back one day to, to tell people what they, what they can do outside, uh, to prepare them to, to what they can do. I couldn't care less about the, the scientific content that I've learned in the PhD right now. I'm more worried that with this knowledge that you have that somebody else can take care of, how can we complement that so that you, you are a good professional in the market? That's, that's what I would like to, to do coming back to the university at some point. And uh, now we are gonna in, in, into pension uh, at the 70s. In 10 years, maybe at the 80s, our life expectancy is increasing. So, don't despair, you have plenty of time. <laughs> and I have a plenty of time in the market too. And you have to take care of the, your, your peers, you have to keep connections because the market is very small and you are gonna meet your, your peers at some point and you're gonna be uh, making new connections. It's very important to maintain that and to, to, to be uh, comfortable with the thing that this is not gonna be the, the job of your life. 
after the first four or five years, you're going to change jobs, or even earlier than that. And you should, because you, you, you cannot get institution, institutionalized. And that's a good thing. So remember that what you are trying to do here is just to find a, a, a wormhole to the next five years. And then you find out about. And then you can go, come back to the university again and try to find out. So don't, don't think that this is going to be your life changer experience or something like this. Be patient with yourself. And thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much, Uma. I think we have time for a question or two. Yeah. Should have put on some different shoes. <laughs> my name is Tobias, and I'm a PhD student here in Olber. Um, you said that there was equivalence between a master's student with seven years of experience and then a newly educated PhD. Could you elaborate on that and on which Yeah, metrics? this is uh, actually, it was surprising to me, but when I applied to my job, it was, uh, it was, uh, it was exactly that, a, a master with seven years experience. And then if, if you go in, this, in, the career, uh, in the career programs of companies, and I've seen the, the ones in, in Novo Nordis and the ones in Coloplat, they actually, they measure that. They measure what is the equivalent of experience to a PhD or to a master. There is the same relationship between a bachelor and a master. And I think it's called the IPE system, uh, International Professional. It's, it's, it's a classification system that they, they use across different companies. I'm, I'm, right now, I think I'm IPE 57 or something like this. And there, there is a whole range of classes. So, yeah. One more question? I think we have something. Hi, I'm Paulina from uh, Aarhus University. Um, the question that I have relates a little bit more specifically to the pharmaceutical industry because um, I'm actually uh, trying to step. I'm actually trying to do the same thing as you did. I'm trying to step out of academia. I ha am actually a postdoc. Um, but uh, whenever I see a job advertisement, it always states that you need to have knowledge of the industrial processes within the pharmaceutical industry or within the food regulations or all that sort of stuff. So how do you tackle that? Yeah, it, it, it's, it, as I said, it's a, it's a, it's a wormhole. I, I wouldn't never get a job at Novo Nordisk if I didn't accept the fact that I would, I would become a librarian at, at first. I was sitting in a desk booth uh, at one evening, uh, one afternoon a month, serving the people, getting books back. And uh, sometimes you, get to, you need to get to the level where I say, OK, I don't have all this. So you take one lower. But then you know that you have all the equipment to, to jumpstart this and to, to jump to another place. Because the thing is also that you need to learn the vocabulary of, of the pharmaceutical industry of the medical, uh, medical device industry. So maybe you are looking at the profile that you don't have and, and, and uh, try to look at the profile that you have, maybe an assistant position, maybe something, it will pay less, yes. Much less than a PhD scholarship, no. Uh, are you gonna be, have an evening, yes, with a PhD, no. So uh, take the things that uh, maybe uh, will do, uh, Give a vacation to yourself. Give your, you the time to take a lower step, a, a lower position, and then, and, then, and then make the jump. Because then you, you get the skills and you, you start connecting people. And it's like a, a trail. You, you meet a person that has a connection to this one, and then you go to this person. I'm interested to this job, do you want? And after the people, they know you as a person. They are willing to take the risk to give you the chance of becoming the specialist that you want to. And I know in Novo Nordisk, for example, they have a lot of QA positions right now, but you need to accept to, to live in, uh, what's the name of, uh, Calumbo. Yeah. <laughs> you need to accept that. And there, there is this kind of thing. I would love to have stayed in Alborg. I love this, this city here. 
but I need to go to Copenhagen in order to get something going. So it's, we need to make choices. And you will not, never, ever find a perfect job. That's, that's for sure. Yeah. I find interesting about the selling of idea. That is one of the interesting. Especially how to sell an idea. Yeah, you have to sell yourself at first. And, uh, and uh, you have to, to get into... You have to get into career fairs and you, net, you, you need to get into, into LinkedIn and not only scan through names, but go, go into the post and try to read it through and try to sell the idea with the vocabulary that they have. Because it's not like the employer, they, they couldn't care less if you did uh, quantum physics. They, they will not understand what you are talking about. They want to understand what they understand coming from you with their vocabulary. So it's, it's the selling idea is actually to whom you are selling the idea with which words you are selling it. I'm going to be in the, in the hall uh, in this break, and uh, you are welcome to, to ask me anything you want to. Yes. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.